Okay, guys, so I had you start with Whitman um, for the poetry section because um, Whitman and Transcendentalism go together. They just do. Um, and there are so many works I could have had you read. There's hard to choose, but I wanted to stick with the same vein of the things that we've been talking about. Um, so I had you start with One Self I Sing, which is a very short poem. Um, if you notice, there is no particular rhyme scheme and there is no particular structure. So we don't have like a certain number of lines per stanza or anything like that. Um, so this is free verse, giving it the feeling of being something that is coming off the top of Whitman's head. So it's almost stream of consciousness. Um, so I want you to notice a few things right off the bat. When we apply literary elements, we want to look for things like symbols, um, uh, alliteration, all, anything you can think of that it's a lit element, we can apply to poetry. Um, so if you look in the first line, there's immediate alliteration. It says, one self I sing, a simple separate person. So why do we have those repeated S's? Um, it creates this almost lyrical quality. So one self I sing, a simple separate person. So you hear that like, da 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 It's almost an I am, almost. Um, he continues on and he says, Yet utter the word democratic, a word in mass. So we have a dichotomy here between democracy, which is of the individual, so the individual has a voice, yet he utters the word in mass, um, meaning in a large group setting, um, a large group, if you will. Um, so he says, a physiology from top to toe, I sing. Again, we have more alliteration. Um, which makes sense given the fact that he's talking about singing, about a song. Um, nor physio physio physiognomy, I'm trying to say it right, um, alone nor brain alone is worthy for the muse. So we have the invocation of the muse. Whenever a poet in, um, invokes the muse, that's the reference to the Greek muse. Um, so this is an allusion here to Greek poetry. Um, and what it is, is, is it's calling upon the muse to inspire the poet to write something which is uh, not only beautiful, but something universal and everlasting. So he's saying, I talk about the person from head to toe, but um, the, he says physio physiognomy, I don't think, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but um, it notes in your book that that's the judging one's character from one's facial expression. So we're talking about combining... He's saying not your your physical appearance nor your brain alone is worthy for the muse, um, but I say the form complete is worthy or far. So I say putting the mind and the character together is what makes you a a, a whole human being. Is what he's saying. Um, so this goes back to that enlightenment. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, transcendentalist belief in in the oversoul. Remember where you have um, the connection with man, with nature, and with God. So you want this complete person to transcend the senses, in other words. Um, and then lastly, I want you to note that line that he says, of female equally with the male I sing. Um, that's really significant because, again, remember part of um, transcendentalism is the fact that women and men held relatively equal station in, in terms of intellectual discussion. So for, again, we're tracing the lineage of, of literature here in terms of larger historical concepts. Take this back to Judah Sargent Murray um, and her, her in, indication that the mind is um, something that a woman has a right to use and, and build just as a man does. Remember she talked about science, she talked about Newton. Um, so this, that's all the way back in the Enlightenment. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, all the way enlightenment, there we go. <laughs> so then we move on, we said, of life immense in passion, pulse, and power. Again, we have that alliteration. But these are very strong staccato words, if you notice that. Passion, pulse, and power. Um, so he's saying life needs to be lived in the moment. It needs to be something that is full and vigorous. Um, that is the way you become this complete person. It says, cheerful for freest action formed under the laws divine. So this is a God-given right to be this way. Um, the modern man I sing. And notice that he capitalizes modern man as this um, figure. It's a, it's a figure here. 
um, uh, one that is desirable, one that is attainable if one does all of these things. So that's one self I sing. Um, we're going to do shut not, uh, not sorry, we're doing song of myself next. So song of myself is, um, really powerful piece and it's, it's an epic poem it's very long I didn't have you read the whole thing I had you read the first few sections um, so again we have this concept of um, vivacity and life and everything being tied and sort of enjoying this freedom of nature and this freedom of, of life and this is not something specific to youth culture which often that type of the mentality that carpe diem mentality is associated with youth culture within poetry, from early modern poetry up to modern poetry. Um, so what he's doing is he's focusing on the individual here, just like Emerson did and Thoreau did, and they said you need to be very self-reliant. He's saying we should celebrate ourselves, our inner and outer selves. Um, so he says, every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. So even though we are all connected in this sort of universal sense, um, you are your own person, I am my own person at the same time. Um, he says, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at ease, observing a spear of summer grass. So something as simple as a blade of grass um, can take someone's entire concentration, entire being. So he's saying, I'm letting myself be at ease. Remember, um, Whitman was a lot like Thoreau. He liked to you know, wander in the woods, and it was all about sort of the respite from the weary long day. Um, so he, he continues on. I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, he says that houses and rooms are full of perfumes. Shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance of myself. I know it and like it. In other words, I am content with the man that I am. And this harkens back to Emerson directly, um, where you don't need someone else's um, uh, praise to, to, to have worth in your being. Um, so he continues on. And we have this, this sensory images, imagery, I should say. Remember, transcendentalism is about transcending the senses. So you, you, you get enveloped by these sensory um, experiences to kind of move beyond the physical into this um, philosophical, spiritual, otherworldly type of plane of being. Um, so the atmosphere is not perfume. It has no taste of the distillation. It is odorless. It is my mouth forever. I am in love with it. Um, I will go to the bank by the wood, become undisguised and naked. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. So this is the height of being one with nature, um, without a doubt. He says, the smoke of my own breath, echo, my own breath, echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, love roots, silk thread, crotch and vine, my respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs. So again, we have this almost stream of consciousness structure. There is, again, this is all free verse. So um, you get this overwhelming sense of emotion and release when Whitman is writing, or at least in these poems. Um, so we, we have some, some images here. We talk about the interplay of light and these natural images and how that's connected to this concept of of physical love and how he has a few light kisses if he embraces the reaching round of arms. So he's comparing the light on nature with um, two couple, a couple in love. And he says, the play and shine of shade on the trees as the supple boughs wag. And I'm going to continue on because it gets a little long. Um, but he's saying, stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left, meaning millions of stars, other universes out there. Um, you shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed the specters in books. So you will no longer be a secondary observer. You will no longer be someone who only intakes information or experiences from books or education or other people's words. You become the person who lives that experience. Um, and then he says... Um, I've heard the talkers were talking and talk at the beginning and the end, but I do not talk of the beginning or end, so I talk in the now. I experience the now. Um, urge and urge and urge, always the uh, appropriate urge of the world. And then we keep going, and he talks about um, more things that have to do with sort of living, living life to the fullest here. He says, 
I'm clear and sweet in my soul. The clear and sweet is all that is not my soul. So we have these constant juxtapositions. Um, and it does sound very hippie-ish if you think about it. Uh, but he's trying to say life is more than this physical being. Life is something beyond this. Um, and if we are able to connect with these things, then we will experience it um, for ourselves and not through other people or other sources. Um, so he says in the last, I am uh, knowing the perfect fitness and equanimity of things while they discuss, I am silent and go bathe and admire myself. So we do not have any type of restrictions here about um, appreciating oneself. So there's no such thing as vanity here. There's no such thing as, as um, remember we talked about the, the bit about philanthropy. Um, there really is no sense of being beholden to anybody else or being worried about judgment from anybody else um, in, in Transcendentalism. It's entirely about appreciating the self and elevating oneself to the highest possibility that you can. Not in relation to other people, but in relation to your own estimation of your self-worth. Um, so, he says, Not an inch nor a particle of his self is vile, and none shall be less familiar than the rest. Um, I am satisfied. I see, dance, laugh, sing. Um, as the hugging and loving bedfellow sleeps at my side through the night and withdraws the peep of the day at the stealthy trend. Uh, he's talking about, you know, each new day brings these brand new adventures um, and, and new experiences and new forays into uh, emotional and, and sensory experiences. Um, so that's kind of where I want to leave you there. It's, it's a really neat poem. If you ever have the time to read the whole thing, go for it. Um, but see how this kind of fits with his earlier assessment of his, his self in, uh, One Self I Sing. And I, I'm going to keep going, um, instead of making two videos. Um, so stick with me just a little bit longer. On I Hear America Singing, I had that as a word doc. Um, this one is one I'm going to show you below. There's a recording of, of Whitman singing this one, and I, uh, singing, uh, reciting this one. I think it's really helpful to kind of hear this. But when you go listen to this, I want you to keep these things in mind. So um, this fits really with the Transcendentalist understanding of national identity and this concept that, you know, we're moving westward to manifest destiny. We are um, becoming this defined nation um, with a defined world presence really is what we're starting to get so he says i hear america singing the voice uh the voiced ver um, sorry the varied carols i hear those of mechanics each one singing as it should be blithe and strong um so when you read this poem you'll notice that we have this continual mention of different occupations but if you notice what type of occupations they are we have mechanics carpenters masons boatmen shoemakers woodcutters so these are the people who are the salt of the earth. These are not the money, the people with servants. These are the people who make the land into something useful um, or make useful things to help build the land, if you will. Um, so it's a little bit of, of a different take compared to uh, Emerson's take on, on the role of nature. This is supporting Manifest Destiny. This is supporting this westward movement. Um, and it also speaks to Thoreau's um, indication about the government working for the individual. Um, here, we're really stressing that the individual is what makes America America, not the government. Um, so he he keeps talking about this this song, and if you notice, that's a theme that Whitman uses a lot. We talked about this sort of universal voiced song of experience. Um, so we've got the mechanics and the carpenter as he's measuring his plank and beam, um, the mason, the boatman, and I, I, you can read for yourself, but we also move into women as well. So he's got um, delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or of the girl sewing and washing. So we have this inclusion of women on a relatively equal plane, um, considering the time period that we're talking about. Um, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. So again, this is the individual's experience, but it's part of this, this overall national community. 
Um, the day what belongs to the day, and then at night, the party of young fellows robust friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Sorry, I lost my screen here. Um, so this is all, again, all about vivacity, and we move into this focus of youth here at the end. So the day belongs to the workers, it belongs to the laborers, it belongs to people building a life, um, and the night belongs to the youth and the freedom and um, kind of what, I mean, the way we kind of would think about it in modern time period. Um, so keep these, these themes in mind as you read. And then the last one I had you read, which also um, I've given you um, the Levi's commercial to go with this because I want you to see a visual interpretation of this poem. The last, I think, four lines of the Levi's commercial um, is Whitman also, uh, it's believed to be Whitman's recording. So, Pioneers, oh Pioneers, when he does this, uh, it's, it's so powerful the way that they interpret this. But um, this one is specifically a call to youth culture and it's a really interesting mix of revolutionary and violent imagery, but but made in an aspiring way. So it's kind of a callback here to throw. So he, he says, come my tan-faced children, so the people who work all day, um, follow well in order, get your weapons ready, have your have you your pistols, have you your sharp-edged axes, pioneers, oh pioneers. So this, this concept of pioneers, westward movement, um, it might take you straight to something like Oregon Trail, uh, but this was a running... Uh, themes, a reality for people in, in, in literature it was how far west can we move, you know, how many things happened to these people, what was it like to settle the land in Texas and Oklahoma and further westward all the way up to California. So this notion of manifest destiny westward expansion is really important here. Um, and if you've never studied manifest destiny, uh, go look it up, Google it to make sure you really understand you know, it, it was the concept that we were destined, God had given us a divine right to expand westward from the east, and we would go as far as we could go, um, and all of the land would be the United States. So, you know, we had the Mexican War, which we annexed Texas from. Um, you know, we had all kinds of things built in to kind of create this struggle until we became the nation that we are. Um, so he says, we cannot tarry here, we must march, my darlings, we must bear the brunt of danger. We, the youthful, sinewy races, all the rest on us depend, pioneers, oh pioneers. So this is that youth idea that I think every generation has, where they think, no generation before us has done this, or we're going to make the world so much better by doing these things. And I think every generation does do that in some way. Um, but he says, oh, you youths, western youths, so impatient, full of action, full of manly pride and friendship. Plain I see you, Western youths. You see you tramping with the foremost. Pioneers, oh pioneers. So we have this refrain of this phrase, pioneers, oh pioneers. And if you say it, it gives this kind of drum beat almost. Pioneers, oh pioneers. So it is an I am. And um, it's really cool when they do this on the Levi's commercial and they put that sort of uh, drum beat or kind of refrain or ratchet sound um, underneath the, the wording. Um, so he talks about the comparison between the youth and the elder races and how the elder races have, have wearied or stopped their um, progress and that it's up to the youth to pick up the mantle and continue on. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but he's talking about specific um, things that are true to manifest destiny ideals. So mining and soil upheaving and building the railroads and he talks about um, you know from the the plateaus and the the peaks of the Great Sierras in Nebraska, Colorado, Arkansas, Missouri um, so you'll see this kind of inclusion of these things which are this is ours, this is our national identity um, so I, I'm not going to go through the rest because I'm at 20 minutes but um, hopefully that does give you a little taste of Whitman. He is a fascinating poet and I hope you enjoyed him. Um, go ahead and go watch the two videos that I've given you, the audio recording and the Levi's commercial. I think it'll give you a deeper understanding of the sound of these poems and how reading it out loud makes it sound that much more powerful um, and impactful.